Spock? I need to speak with you. <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 sci fi references on The Big Bang Theory. Oh, no, not Morlocks! Not flesh eating Morlocks! For this list, we'll be looking at the most notable science fiction references made on the show. We won't, however, be dipping into the superhero genre, as that deserves a list of its own. What's your favorite sci fi callback? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. The Matrix Franchise The Wachowskis' famous quadrilogy has a couple notable appearances on the show in the early seasons. We're having a small welcoming party this afternoon for Mr. Kim, who's agreed to join us here at the university. Of course he has. The Oracle told us little Neo was the one. <laughs> You can see the Matrix, can't you? Dennis Kim's arrival at the university has Sheldon referring to him as Neo, asking him if he can see the Matrix. Then Leonard mentions Sheldon's inability to understand the third Matrix movie a couple years later. I haven't seen him this stuck since he tried to figure out the third Matrix movie. Our favorite, however, comes near the start of the show's sophomore season. While having lunch at the university with Leonard, Sheldon cites the quality of the cafeteria food as reason enough to believe they aren't in a simulation. You know how I know we're not in the Matrix? <laughs> how? If we were, the food would be better. Given Cypher's discussion with Agent Smith about his steak, we're pretty sure Sheldon is right. I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy, and delicious. Number nine, The Outer Limits. He's been murdered by someone in this room. Oh my God. Come on. Welcome to another classic Kutrapali murder mystery dinner. I'm leaving. Raj manages to give us one of the best episodes of the show during the season seven scavenger hunt. As a sequel, the season later includes a murder mystery at the boys' apartment that features a time travel twist. I've seen old pictures of you. You were never a fat kid. No, I was felt as a gazelle. <laughs> a gazelle blessed with a flair for storytelling. One of them traveled back in time to murder someone, much like the plot of The Terminator. It's here that we get a nice nod to The Outer Limits, which has had several iterations since its 1963 debut. Raj and Leonard argue about which script from the old show was used as inspiration for the Schwarzenegger-led film. Does the smartass know that Terminator was actually ripped off from an Outer Limits script called Demon of the Glass Hand by Harlan Ellison? Oh, does the gazelle know that according to Harlan Ellison, it was not ripped off from Demon with a Glass Hand, but was ripped off from another Outer Limits script he wrote called The Soldier? It's a small reference that shines due to its use of obscure knowledge around sci-fi television. Number eight. Wally. Wally. In a season three gem of an episode, we see a similar theme follow both the primary and secondary plots. As Leonard, Raj, and Howard deal with the aftermath of some special brownies, Penny too is feeling a little loopy from the heavy pain medications she's had to take. Sheldon takes on the role as her caretaker for the evening after she dislocates her shoulder. Wait. You have to help me get into bed. <laughs> Sheldon has to get me into bed. <laughs> Bet you never thought I'd say that. <laughs> Upon helping her into bed, Penny compares Sheldon's often robotic behavior to that of Pixar's Wally. -E. He's misunderstood, but under his hard shell is a heart of gold. People think you're this weird robot man who's so annoying all the time, and you totally are. <laughs> movie Wally -E at the end. You're so full of love and you can save a plant and get fat people out of the floaty chairs. It's a small nod to a great movie from one of the season's best episodes. Number seven, 2001 A Space Odyssey. 2001 A Space Odyssey is often cited as one of the best science fiction films of all time. A huge part of the film is the musical score as it helps drive the narrative. In a season one episode, we're treated to the show's own tribute to the Dawn of Man sequence in the classic flick. After using a computer and the internet to remotely turn on the stereo, we hear the famous music playing. <laughs> A 
As the guys jump and pound their chests, much like the movie's apes, Penny stands in the doorway, confused by what the fuss is all about. It's a little loud. No problem, turning it down. San Francisco, Lisbon, Halifax. Et voila. <laughs> Number six, Scanners. From the same episode as the previous entry, this one finds Sheldon at odds with Leonard regarding a paper they've been invited to present. I have no interest in standing in the Rose Room of the Pasadena Marriott in front of a group of judgmental strangers who wouldn't recognize true genius if it were standing in front of them giving a speech. <laughs> Which if I were there, it would be. Sheldon doesn't want to lower himself by presenting their findings, but Leonard does so anyway. There, Sheldon attempts to blow up Leonard using nothing more than his mind. You cannot blow up my head with your mind. Then I'll settle for an aneurysm. Stop it. You hit me. You saw that he hit me. I'm trying to blow up my head. So it was working. It wasn't. It was not. You are a nutcase. Oh, we'll see about that. Heads up, you people in the front row. This is a splash zone. It's a clear nod to the 1981 sci-fi film Scanners, where unusual psychic powers are used to defeat enemies. In one notable scene, a scanner uses his ability to force someone to literally lose his head. Even Penny gets in on the action towards the end. Would you like to explain to me why your Facebook page has a picture of me sleeping on your shoulder captioned, me and my girlfriend? Uh-oh, here comes the talk. <laughs> Number five, Babylon 5. After you finished breakfast, I thought we could spend the day watching the final season of Babylon 5 with director commentary. You hate Babylon 5. I do. It fails as drama, science fiction, and it's hopelessly derivative. During the penultimate episode of season three, fans are given a treat when the show flashes back to the early days of Sheldon and Leonard's friendship. Along with giving us the origins of Sheldon's spot and what happened to the elevator, we also see the first instance of Sheldon's disdain for the show Babylon 5. Ooh, it's time for Babylon 5. We don't watch Babylon 5 in this apartment. Why not? Because no one likes Babylon 5. <laughs> I like it. Me too. So do I. There you go, three against one. He described his dislike of the show a few episodes earlier, but this instance shows us how he was the only one of the boys who truly hated the sci-fi program. We love seeing references like this that highlight some of the lesser known properties out there. Up next, Babylon 5. <laughs> I can hear it. <laughs> the dialogue offend you? I would hardly call that dialogue. Number four, Firefly. When fans speak of shows with a cult-like following, there's one that consistently comes out near the top, Firefly. Now you can luxuriate in a nice jail cell, but if your hand touches metal, I swear by my pretty floor bonnet, I will end you. Joss Whedon's space western only lasted one season, but the rabid fan base is still going strong. So it's no wonder that the Big Bang Theory has had its own share of nods to it. If I didn't have you, life would be dreary. I'd be string theory without any string. I'd be binary code without a one, a cathode ray two without an electron gun. I'd be Firefly buffing Avengers without Joss Whedon. Howard includes it in his song to Bernadette while she's in quarantine, and Nathan Fillion even appears as a guest star. If you're really Nathan Fillion, what's the line from Firefly about your bonnet? I swear by my pretty floral bonnet, I will end you. <laughs> but our favorite goes to Sheldon's inclusion of watching Firefly in the infamous roommate agreement with Leonard. Does that really need to be in the agreement? We might as well settle it now. It's going to be on for years. <laughs> the flashback, of course, takes place when the show was still on the air, and we love how Sheldon was so sure it would last for years. Number three, The Time Machine. Thinking it's a miniature replica from the 1960s film The Time Machine, Leonard inadvertently purchases the full-scale version of the titular movie prop. I still don't understand why no one else bid. <laughs> I understand why no one else bid. The device itself serves as the centerpiece to the episode, which finds Leonard questioning his love of science fiction. That doesn't mean, however, that we don't get some great laughs. Hey, if you wait for us to set up the time machine, I can drop you off at work yesterday. <laughs> time travel joke. It's not, never mind. <laughs> it starts with the boys trying to get the machine up the stairs, while inadvertently causing Penny to be late for work. 
once in the apartment, were treated to a hilarious bit featuring the boys traveling through time, giving a fantastic nod to the original film's depiction of time travel. Here we go into the future. <laughs> Number 2. Star Wars Franchise Much like another entry on our list, there are so many references to Star Wars on this show that picking one of them as the best is an impossible feat. Those are the robes of the Jedi, the guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy. And they, they, they don't wear underwear. <laughs> Isn't Bob Newhart's Obi-Wan pretty awesome? How about Mark Hamill officiating Sheldon and Amy's wedding? And by the power vested in me, by even you can perform weddings.com. <laughs> I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. <laughs> Sheldon even mentions Leonard's Star Wars shampoo in the pilot episode. Do you think this possibility will be helped or hindered when she discovers your Luke Skywalker No More Tears shampoo? It's Darth Vader shampoo. <laughs> Luke Skywalker's the conditioner. <laughs> but our favorite pick goes to the season nine episode, The Opening Night Excitation. We get a combo of Obi Arthur, countless conversations about the new movie, and even a Star Wars-esque opening crawl. There's even a nice jab at Star Trek fans with Will Wheaton's appearance at the theater. What else could you ask for? I was on Star Trek, just rooting for the home team. <laughs> Star Trek stinks. Yeah, live long and suck it. <laughs> Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into settings and switch on your notifications. Number one, Star Trek franchise. I know Mr. Data isn't supposed to smile, but here it comes. <laughs> Perhaps the most referenced sci-fi franchise on the show, Star Trek could almost be classified as its own character amongst the boys. You're Kirk, I'm Spock, Wallowitz is Scotty, Kutherpali is the guy who always gets killed. <laughs> and now we've got McCoy. From the Getaway Team episode to the ongoing comparison of Sheldon to Mr. Spock, there's no lack of nods to this legendary show. That also makes it hard to pick one single reference as the best from all 12 seasons. Who doesn't love seeing them dressed up as the cast from The Next Generation? Or Sheldon finding a Gorn in his living room? You're sleeping now. Excuse me? You're having a guilt-ridden dream. Do you have any evidence to support that hypothesis? How about that Gorn sitting on the couch? <laughs> But for this list, we're going with the Star Trek Transporter episode, which heavily features Mr. Spock and the voice of the late Leonard Nimoy. How could you not enjoy the action figure's memorable poses with Nimoy's great dialogue? What is the purpose of a toy? To be played with. Therefore, to not play with it would be... Illogical. Oh, damn it, Spock, you're right. <laughs> Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.